a pleasure to be here again and lecture. I gave here a lecture maybe 10 years ago, a series of lectures. Uh, so here I am again. So um, I was at the meeting in Philadelphia of, of some society on Friday. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, customary to, uh, to have humor. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a joke not about auctions but about cryptography. And it is something that I've heard. I don't know, uh, you know, how historically how true it is. But in China, uh, when they had all of these warlords, uh, and China was divided into small pieces, each under its own warlord, and they were fighting each other. So they had the following method of sending secret mes messages, crypt cryptographic method of sending secret messages uh, along uh, across enemy lines. Namely, they would take a fellow, shave his head, write the message on his head, then wait until the hair grew again. And there was no rush in those years and send him across lines, and when he would get to the other side, to, to whoever they wanted uh, to receive the message, his head was shaved and the message was being read. And uh, so I said in reaction, this was tried on me once with absolutely disastrous results. Okay, so we are going to, the title says what we are going to do. Part of this work goes back to 2007 uh, and 2009, uh, and part of it uh, is newer work uh, together, the, uh, the latest part, together with uh, Silvio Micali, uh, uh, 2011 and 2011-2012. Uh, so let us talk about auctions. And uh, because the main topic is going to be second price auctions, so-called Vickery auctions, I'm going to describe directly Vickery auctions. So there is an item, there are these bidders, they make these bids in sealed envelopes. Sealed envelopes means, of course, nowadays not a physical envelope, but they are sending the bids in encrypted to the uh, auctioneer. And then, uh, so they submit these sealed bids, each of them, and I'm going to talk about the commitment function later on, but I assume that some encryption function is being used. Each of them chooses a key and sends in, you know, his bid. And then the auctioneer we call also evaluator prover. Uh, he posts these. Uh, and then at the closing of the uh, auction time, each of them sends in his key. The auctioneer knows then what the bids are. And in the Vickery auction, the highest bid, they could be here greater or equal, but the highest bid is getting the auction, uh, the item, and he's paying the second highest price. And we'll come back to Vickery auctions later on. Those were discovered by Vickery. The idea of a second uh, price auction was suggested by, uh, by Vickery. And it has the advantage, and we can go into that later on, that uh, under absent collusion, this gives incentive to every participant to bid his true private value for the item. Maybe just one word, think about an English auction where a Rembrandt says up for auction at Sotheby's and uh, the various bidders, of course very wealthy people come in and each of them has his own private price uh, that he's willing to pay. And let's not consider the emotional things uh, that, you know, I am a rich guy and he is almost as rich as I am. He makes a bid and then I move away from what I had in mind to begin with. So without emotions. So let's say the reserve price under which 
the Rembrandt is not going to be sold is $10 million, starts with $10 million. Some people say yes. Then it goes up to $10.5 million and so on. And let us say that Avi actually is willing to pay $20 million. But when it gets to $15.5 million, nobody is bidding. He is still bidding, but nobody else is bidding. So he is essentially the highest bidder, potentially, in the uh, open auction. And uh, he is actually paying the second highest price. So the Vickery is uh, simulating that with uh, sealed bid auctions where there is no, not somebody who announces it. Now I want to talk about secrecy. The, in many important auctions, the bidders uh, do not want their bid values to become known. Think about uh, oil companies bidding for uh, drilling rights in the Gulf of Mexico. Each of them has a certain private information by trial uh, drills and so on of the potential value of various sites. And they don't want the competitors, whether they won or lost in this particular auction, they don't want the competitors to know their bid values so that they uh, cannot strategize, competitors strategize against them. At the same time, however, they want to know the correctness of the announced result, but they want to keep their bids secret. So uh, to this, uh, for example, we spoke to the people at the Federal Reserve in New York who are conducting the auctions of T-bills. There the bids, uh, the bidding is, um, is on interest rates. The government is interested uh, to, to give the, uh, the bundles, now we are talking about $80 billion a week, uh, uh, maybe even a little more. And uh, the, the, the various uh, investment banks and so on, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs and so on, are suggesting interest rates. And the government is, uh, is interested, sorry about the repetition of the word, uh, in, in, of course, paying the lowest interest. So they submit sealed bids. And the Fed Reserve is announcing what the interest rate is going to be and how parcels are going to be allotted, but does keeps the, uh, the bids, submitted bids, secret. And of course, Fed Reserve is above suspicion, but everybody has to trust the Fed Reserve. In this case, do they use uh, electronic bidding or the real envelope? No, of course, electronic. It used to be real envelopes. I, I really don't want. There was a time where in these real envelope bids, uh, people would, first of all, they would want to submit their envelopes at the very last minute so because they weren't sure that somebody is not opening and taking a peek uh, before the uh, closing of the auction. So that they uh, would come down and sit in the lobby and then rush in in the last five minutes. And because of that, sometimes when there was a traffic jam on the way to Wall Street, you know, these husky young men would get out of the cab and run to make it in time. So now electronic bids. Yeah, th that's better. OK. So we need uh, uh, to, to support evaluation of and proofs of predicates such as x greater than y. Now I'm going to, uh, to sort of uh, speak a little bit against the existing methods. So there are existing technologies. What we really need is something which is a zero knowledge proof using. Uh, so uh, we can prove that uh, a string x is in a language, in an NP language, zero knowledge proofs. We can prove circuit satisfiability. Uh, so we go down to the bit level and we express uh, the bids in, ter in terms of 
bits and so on. Or we can use homomorphic encryption such as Paye encryption. Uh, we wrote a paper with a number of people doing exactly that. We can use the obfuscated circuits and the R. We can use multi-party computations. These, uh, in addition to have, having serious efficiency uh, problems, they only keep the bids secret, but they don't provide a proof of correctness of the result. So if this complicated multi-party computation was somehow misprogrammed, then uh, you are not sure that, uh, uh, that, uh, that actually the announced result is correct. So all that is no good. So now we talk about our approach. It started with a paper with uh, uh, Servidio and Thorpe in this year. And then uh, I was invited to, um, to Google. They are very interested. Uh, and I spent half a year in 2009. Uh, Mutu Krishnan, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Mansur, Mutu Krishnan, and, and uh, Moti Jung. And we uh, uh, made it even much more efficient than we had in 2007. The idea is to work directly with numbers in a finite field where P is a prime, but not these uh, terrific primes used in cryptography. P is a prime, say, with 120 bits. And that means uh, that, you know, on your laptop computer, this is two words, and computation with these numbers are really, you know, lightning speed. You can do billions of additions and multiplications, even mod p, uh, in, in, uh, in a second. So now, uh, uh, now uh, uh, we go beyond auctions and we talk about generalized straight line computations. Therefore, I had that evaluator prover. So a straight line computation is uh, the following. It is something where, for example, this is not necessary, but let's say that there are players P1 up to Pn who submit inputs, and an evaluator prover conducts the following. These are the inputs. The next ones, Xn plus 1 up to Xl, uh, up to Xl minus 1, uh, up to XL are, uh, for each of these, either there are two previous indices so that XM is the sum mod P or the product mod P or the truth value of the inequality taken as numbers. Uh, so 67 and 82 are also as numbers. They are elements of this field and 62 is smaller than 82, I think I said. We can add also divisions and so on, but it doesn't matter. So and is that uh, I'm sorry, is that yes? Is there some indices mentioned that two is one and four is zero? For example, sure, sure. So it's still mod P. Yeah, yeah. But no, but eventually the truth value is going to be a zero or a one. So XM is going to be one if as integers and so on. Good, thanks. So, uh, and then these are the, out, uh, the, out, uh, uh, the outputs, the results, xl plus 1 up to x uh, whatever. And the evaluator prover, what is going to happen is that the evaluator prover posts the inputs, the inputs and the, the inputs in closed envelopes and the outputs as numbers, zeros and ones and so on for the inequalities. And then he posts a value hiding proof of the correctness of the results. And the proof of correctness is checked by, the, by, uh, by any verifier interacting with the EP. Now, it will turn out that these. So, what, what is the input to the evaluator 
the, all the bits, for example, or all the inputs to the yes. all the actual inputs to the program that you are yes. specifying program that yes. should be evaluated. Yes. So for example, in the case of auction, these are bids. These are the bids. And they're, they're encrypted bids. Yes, yes. And these are being posted, and I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll describe how they are being posted. So then uh, we are the bidders. We all have access to the secure bulletin board and how that is being implemented. These are uh, d uh, trivial details. So we all look at them. And then uh, the evaluator approver, in this case, uh, say, uh, announces uh, that Avi won the item if it's Vickery and tells uh, Avi that he has to pay uh, $15 million, we, s we said. Uh, and then uh, uh, some of the bidders may, may be suspicious, may want to have a proof or a judge or an auditor. And the evaluator approver can provide this proof. Now, this is not zero knowledge in the classical sense. So for example, the zero knowledge-ness is not proved by having then a simulator. These are really value hiding proofs. And you'll see how, I, uh, how that is defined. So but the value hiding is that you wish I had zero knowledge. Yes, but in practice so it's. Yeah, that's all you want to hide, but it's uh, like Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yes. Pardon me? Ah, sure, sure. I forgot to mention, uh, I would come back to it, but thanks for the question. Uh, namely, at the end of the auction, uh, each of the bidders, if we are talking about the auction, is sending his key. And then the evaluator approver, the auctioneer, opens it so he knows. And then he provides and constructs the value hiding proof. When? I'll come back to that. So you have to trust the auctioneer, and it could be that there is a bad apple there, you know, who, um, uh, who is leaking out information. An employee who, for half a million dollars, is going to tell Shell how much uh, Bri Bri British Petroleum has bid. But you can also combine this with the technology of secure processors. There are these IBM secure processors where the information comes in and then the result comes out and nothing else. Now, when you have that secure enclosed processor, it's doubly important to have a proof of correctness because it may be that it was misprogrammed. But then you have an objective proof which is trivially, really trivially checkable. And then you know the correctness of the result, and you have no idea of what went on inside. And in that case, all the bids go in, the sealed envelopes go in into the sealed, into the sealed processor, the secure processor. Then they are sending the keys in uh, and so on, secure processor opens, blah, blah, posts, of course, before that, opens, blah, 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 and everything we are doing there is then uh, there is a proof which is checkable. Okay, now which the. Which point do they send the proof? Pardon me? Which point do they send the proof? At the close of the auction. The auction ends, the auction submitting of bids ends. Monday morning at 12 noon at the end of this lecture, and, uh, and then they send in the, key, the uh, decryption keys. Okay, so there is no room in, room in for uh, homomorphic evaluation? No, oh, I, I'm going to badmouth homomorphic encryption at the end, and you'll see how bad it is. And that's completely different from what we did in previous, and other people did in previous papers. Okay, so the magical idea was the following, that values are being represented as two uh, coordinate vectors. So 
we have a random representation of a value lowercase x is x, uv. By definition, the value of such a vector is the sum of the coordinates mod p. How do we create a random representation? So the bidders, for example, they submit their bids by, it's going to be somewhat more complicated, but they are submitting their bids for the, uh, for the uh, Vickery auction and uh, countering uh, collusion. It's going to be more complicated, but let's say an ordinary auction. So each bidder is going to create a random representation. How does he create a random representation? U is being chosen randomly. That's uh, the Michali Goldwasser, uh, Goldwasser Michali notation. And then, of course, V is X minus U. And then there is some commitment function, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But think about this as closed envelopes. Uh, and different encryption keys are used for every commitment. Uh, so uh, the evaluator prover needs to be able to give value hiding proof to statements such as the value of x plus the value of R, y is equal to the value of z, if in the straight line computation there was an addition. The value of x, capital X, but x, x you know, is hidden there, and y are hidden there, and z are hidden there, but the value times the value is equal to the value, or the value of x for the auctions is less or equal to the value of y. This is incredibly simple, incredibly simple to do. How do we do commitments? Uh, so I'm going to very briefly mention the Pedersen co commitment. There is a group uh, of prime orders, say, where Q is bigger than P. Uh, the, the, the group with P elements may be too small, but we take some, uh, a group like that. Uh, every non-unit element is a generator. Uh, if G1 is a generator, then we have the definition of the log of G2 to the, and so on. We assume that the discrete log problem for G is intractable, a standard assumption about the group that, of course, nobody can prove. Uh, and, you know, once quantum computers will exist, it's not going to be uh, hold, but now it still holds. Now, how do we commit to a, so G1 and G2 are post, uh, uh, G1 and G2 are posted, given a value here, the person who wants to commit chooses randomly something between zero and Q minus one, not P minus one. And the commitment to you with the help value R is G1 to the R, the help value, times G to, to the U. Now, the commitment, you can easily prove that this is simply a random element. And therefore, the commitment is information theoretic hiding. From looking at the commitment value, nothing can be said about the value that's inside that envelope. And it is computationally hiding Binding, sorry. Because if somebody who made this commitment can open it in two ways, that means he can calculate the discrete log. So, uh, so these are, we use that commitment for the proofs. In practice, of course, that's what we did, and also at Google when they implemented it, we use an encryption function, we use AES and so on. I want to mention a point which is a little bit subtle. Namely, there is a certain malleability of this function. If I see a commitment to a value u, even without knowing what u is, I can create a commitment to the value u plus one by taking this commitment and multiplying it by G2. Then when it's being opened, I, I can open mine and say that I 
that I bid, you know, u plus one, say. And uh, therefore, in the proofs and so on, we give each of the participants a different pair for the same group. We give each of the participants, let's say NIST published the, published the group, uh, NIST does that, and then uh, uh, there are pairs of, uh, uh, of generators, and Avi gets one pair, and you get another pair, and so on, and all of those pairs which are being used by the evaluator prover and by the uh, participants, by the bidders, are posted, signed by them, etc. So this gets around the malleability, can be proven. So in practice, of course, we can prove nothing. Uh, here we have, a, a, you know, a, 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 an open question whether this is intractable. About AAS, nothing is provable, but okay. And to decommit, you reveal the key K and U. Okay. Uh, there are also some details uh, here, that uh, even with this, but now we want to show you in lightning speed how a verification of addition is done. So you have X, which is a random representation of the value U1 plus V1. I omit mod P. Whenever I talk here about plus times, it's always mod P. So you have these uh, representations of values, and uh, these uh, uh, these are being posted by posting uh, either by the evaluator prover or whoever posted it, but the evaluator prover knows how to open these commitments, and he claims that the value of x plus the value of y is equal to the value of z. And that's going to a claim in the proof of correctness of, you know, the uh, the uh, straight line uh, of an intermediate result or a final result in the straight line computation. Now, this is a little bit different from saying that as vectors x plus y is equal to z. It, it's really equivalent to saying that x plus y is z plus the zero vector. So when challenged by a verifier, EP reveals R. And the verifier makes a random choice one or two, and he challenges EP. Now assume that he said C equals one. The evaluator prover opens the first coordinate, you know, in each of these. Co and so now the verifier checks that U1 plus U2, not U2 Brutus, but uh, the number uh, U2, u1 plus u2 is equal to u3 plus r. And in the other case, he does the other thing. Now, if the claim is wrong, then at least one of these will not work out. And therefore, the probability that 3 is false and the verifier will accept is at most one half. Now, I may be uh, touching on that point later on, but I want to show, to, men uh, to mention even now, standing, so to speak, like uh, ancient Hebrew saying, on one leg is enough. Why this is completely value hiding? Because only the first coordinates were revealed. And because these are random representations, this is consistent with any second coordinate values, provided that the value of x plus the value of y is equal to the value of z. This is completely information theoretic hiding. Absolutely and completely information theoretic hiding. Let me mention, by the way, that even in a moment, even if later on somebody uh, uh, breaks, you know, the intractability, so let's say that we were using, we were using this wonderful method, 
uh, to uh, conduct auctions and so on now this week. And in two years from now, somebody is breaking the, uh, the, uh, the discrete log problem for that group. Still everything is going to remain secret because the, in, uh, the commitment function is information theoretic hiding. And the proof was conducted while it was binding and therefore it's still valid. So you have, uh, okay. Goody. Yes. Pardon me? Could I? Go back one slide? Sure. No, no. The, the value of x plus value of y is equal to the value of z if there is a zero-valued vector, but that, that is unique. The r minus r, that's unique. Think. Okay. So the, the, the r is unique. The r is unique. And the R is, of course, for every addition that is being proved. And then I'll talk about doing simultaneously 2,000 additions. There is going, for every addition, there is going to be a different R. You had a question. Let, let me talk to that point. It's a good question. First of all, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the uh, bidders, all of them, get, can get together. Then they just have to decide how together to manufacture the random challenges. And uh, these are well-known problems, how to do random challenges. You may also... Now there is another thing, and that has to do with the work we did at Google. Uh, what we can do, you see, once a proof like that was given, then the, uh, the commitment, say, to X and commitment to Y and so on was already touched. You cannot do it again because that might involve opening the other coordinate. So the Michael's 11th commandment is, thou shalt open two coordinates of the same commitment. So how do you do many proofs? Anyway, you, you want to improve uh, on the one half. You prepare many copies in advance. And then whichever copy of the translation of the value hiding proof translation was used is not touched again. And in fact, uh, uh, the technology we developed at Google is such that you can, for example, start with 60 uh, version, so to speak, not of the whole proof, only of the uh, input. And then each is extended to proof. But then th this is extensible in a way so that they can, two years, they can give more and more and more and more proofs upon demand. Okay, so let me go on. And I'm going to give, for this uh, wonderful audience, I'm going to give an illustration. So I choose P17. When I was a student at Princeton, uh, I took a course at Feller and uh, on probability theory. Uh, this stuff didn't exist, of course. Uh, so he would say, let's choose a random number. And it was always 17. So I chose a random number, 17, which is a prime. You have these values. You can check that these are random representations of these values, it's mod 17, you remember. Well, if it came from me after a couple of whiskeys, very random. <laughs> no, no. So, <laughs> no, you cannot check that they are random, you're right. We discussed that point actually. And, uh, so, uh, I claim, uh, evaluator prover claims this, the, uh, the uh, R here is 10 minus 10. And then if you toss the coin and the coin came out to be 1, 
then these envelopes, the top envelopes, are being opened. And then it's being checked that 3 plus 15 mod, uh, mod, uh, mod 17 is 1, 8 plus 10 mod 17 is 1. Similarly for the other. And again, if somebody is trying to lie, his probability of getting away with a lie is smaller. Okay. Now, if there are sequences of additions, so you have this straight line computation. There are 250 additions in there, 250 additions, 1,000 additions in there, depending. And so what is being done, all of them are simultaneously. Namely, uh, the verifier says, I want to check all additions. So the evaluator prover gives R1, R1 minus R1, R2 minus R2, and so on. Then, and that's very important, the same coordinate, either the first or the second, is opened in all of them. And even if one of these additions is false, one of these 2,500 additions is false, the probability of getting away with a lie of the verifier accepting is less or equal to one half. Hmm, not bad. So now we want to do multiplications, and I'm going to do it very quickly. So suppose that you have these uh, random uh, representations of values, lowercase x, lowercase y, lowercase z, and the evaluator pro uh, prover claims this. What are posted are the commitments to these vectors, all keys, all help values are different and independent. But the evaluator prover at this point knows all of them. Either he has created some of these, so let's say x and y were inputs, and z is something that he computed, but he knows everything. So the evaluator prover expands the, you know, the straight line computation by these vectors u1 times u2, so on, u1 times v2, r1 minus r1. Notice that this is a random. He chose the r's randomly out of fp. Notice that this is a random representation of the value u1 times v2, because the value of this z uh, superscript 1 is this plus that, and that's exactly u1 times v2, and so on. So this is a reduction for multiplication of uh, two additions. Yeah. yeah. So 4 is true, as Avi has said, if the value of z is equal to the free value. By the way, an equation like that is being proved in the same way. You don't have to do it in two steps. You use 1 r minus r here. And then you check that the first coordinate here plus first coordinate, blah, blah, blah. So these are being posted. And the uh, uh, now the verifier checks the correctness of one of these. So for example, he wants to check that z0 z is correct. And he's going to check it in this way, by opening the first coordinates of all vectors. And this is going to be used also for checking this addition, and as well as checking that u1 times u2 is equal to the first coordinate. Now there is a slight transgression from the 11th commandment, because to check that the value of z1 is equal to u1 times v2, you have to open the first and the second coordinates. So that can be done. And all you have to do in order to avoid uh, 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 revealing too much is that each vector, you see a, a vector can be 
involved in a multiplication as the multiplier, so the xi times xj, but also as xl times xi. And that would reveal, in, in this case, both coordinates. So the vectors that are being involved bo both as a multiplier and multiplicand are being, there is a left-hand version and a right-hand version, which are equal in value. And then you can check that this reveals nothing and so on. So I don't want to go into the details. Uh, there is a paper which describes all of that. Now, there is a question of how do we prove inequalities. And uh, this was really a pleasure to, to discover. It turns out that inequalities can be reduced to additions and multiplications. And as follows, now I have to move there without falling off the, uh, the stage here. Everybody can see this stuff here. So you want to prove, suppose that you have two numbers in FP and you want to prove that why you, it's being claimed that y is greater than x. Of course, they are given by the commitments as posted by the commitments com y. And you want to prove that. It turns out that if you can prove the following, that x is less than p over 2 and y is less than p over 2. And y minus x, of course we have only mod p, is less than p over 2, then actually y is greater than x. Because if both are below p over 2 and y as an integer is smaller, then y minus x would roll around and become bigger. So the issue of proving inequalities, so first of all, when we talk about these bids, you know, p is 2 to the 128, p to over 2 is 2 to the 123, not 2 to the 100, not 2 to the 64, please. It's 2 to the 123, so that's big enough for uh, proving correctness of auctions. Uh, so now we, uh, we, uh, I, I'm going to do it only with lightning speed without all the details, but the details appear in the paper uh, MMY209. Uh, 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 no, two, 209 was when the work was done. I think it's 212 or 11, I forget, uh, in ICAL. So there you can see the details. But the details are the following. Uh, but actually, that also goes to the 2007 paper, the first paper. Uh, we uh, that idea already appeared there. So given a B, an explicit number, given a B, and given a number which is between 0 and b, a value hiding proof can be conducted using only additions, which is going to show that x is less or equal to 2b, or x is greater than minus b, which means actually that x is greater than p minus b. So, so this is bad. It doesn't tell you anything about x. You cannot prove things like this. But notice that, uh, l let me write here uh, w. Notice that if you have proved that, then you have shown that w squared mod p, it doesn't matter, is less than 4b squared. 
So now we are going to use, or we have used, the theorem that every integer is a sum of four squares. Not must be, sum of four squares. This was proved by Lagrange in uh, 1770, and uh, in 1970 uh, plus, uh, in my MIT lecture, and then it appeared in a paper, uh, I found a very efficient algorithm for doing that. The Lagrange proof gives you nothing, but using that algorithm, uh, this was um, uh, numbers p, uh, numbers y smaller than 2 to the 64, 150,000 representations as a sum of four squares using that algorithm, which is, by the way, randomized but without errors, of course. Uh, it's, uh, it's Las Vegas, not Monte Carlo. Uh, 150,000 of those were done in a second. Yes. Maybe a minute, but it doesn't make a difference because, you know, these proofs, a minute, you can also wait. So this was then worked into the reduction of inequalities to the reduction of inequalities to, uh, uh, to additions and multiplications. And again, we don't go down to the bit level. We work with complete numbers. So uh, correctness of auctions, keeping bids. So the AU has posted bids in this way. He needs to prove claims such as that. He gets the proof of correctness and so on. And then it turns out that the, uh, the verifier chooses either to check all the correctness of, the, of these vectors for the multiplication and all additions. He chooses that with probability one half. And he chooses verifying the correctness by revealing both coordinates of this, but that reveals nothing, both coordinates of this and the U2 and V1 and so on, or that or the other one with probability one quarter. And it turns out that then the, in a single proof like that, the probability of accepting the proof and that also gets you the correctness of all the claimed inequalities. Uh, the probability of accepting claims is less than three quarters. That's not bad, still, of course, not good enough in real life. Now, the amplification of confidence is, and I'm going to describe how that can be repeated k times. So. Be because you make copies, uh, we, are, we are going to have a black box copying of sequences like that. So uh, you do it k times like uh, 50, 30, and then the probability of being cheated is 3 over 4 to the power 30. That's already reasonable in, in real life. Good. Now, I come to the, to the new stuff, to the new stuff. So Vickery auctions have that advantage that was, was already uh, demonstrated by Vickery. He got a Nobel Prize, by the way, but he, he, he didn't get to, he, his family got the money. He, he passed away before, before the ceremony. So, um, uh, so they have the advantage of, uh, in favor of the auctioneer, the seller, that the people are incentivized, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, to bid the true value. But 
they are very prone to collusion. So the bidders can, for example, we, we have the, the most general model of collusion, they can have a discussion prior, prior, prior to the auction closing time. Now there is always a reserve value. So the item is not going to be sold below $100 million. So they, they see what the bids are and they decide B1 is the person if they all tell the truth. Of course, there is no honor between thieves. They can be cheating each other, but they decide and come to the conclusion that he is going to have the highest bid. He is going to bid his private value B1. Everybody else will bid the reserve value and he gets the item and he'll pay the reserve value. The reason the auctioneer, the seller, went to the auction was to get more than the reserve value. Because he could have said, I'm, I'm selling the Empire State Building for a billion dollars. Whoever comes first gets it. He's going to an auction because he's hoping to get more. And he's being robbed of the advantage of the auction. B1 makes agreed upon site, not site, side payments to the other bidders. Okay? And that's for them the incentive they say to themselves, we are not going to win anyway. We are going to get some of the difference between B1 and R. So, goody. And that happened in real life, and there were people who went to jail for that kind of behavior. And for that reason, uh, uh, second price, sealed bid, second price auctions are very rarely being used. There were really weird things where uh, I read the literature where, say, all the bidders from Massachusetts had bids ed ending in 617. Or s things like that. They, they were really signal. It was awful. Okay. Now I want to talk about the limitations, the natural limitation of what Silvio and yours truly did. Our results apply only to one-time auctions for the following reason. That if the auctions are repeated, then this is, you know, in theory of games, these are repeated games. They may have an incentive to stick to their agreements because this time we let you win and you'll uh, have the benefit the next time and so on. So in repeated auctions, but there are many very important auctions which are one-time auctions for an item. So Empire State Building sold only once. Okay, so, and we, we uh, okay, one can work about the other uh, thing, uh, but good. So now, uh, we want to have uncontrollable, deniable submitting of bids. Uncontrollable means, you see, if you have these sealed bid auctions, even commitments in pairs of envelopes, so if we are all colluding, uh, then we give Avi, you know, the envelopes. He has to submit and he has to post those and we can see on the bulletin board whether he did or did not post those. So we want to, uh, to have it unenforceable, uncontrollable. But also, if he posted something then he knows the decryption keys. So we can come to him even before the closing of the auction and we can so, not so, we can tell him, give us the health values, the decryption keys, and we'll check whether you are really bidding as pro promised. So that seems to be sealed envelope and deniability. How can they be re reconciled? Okay, so, so let me. When, when people submit bids here, even if they are colluding, hmm? so collusion or not, people submit their bids individually, right? Yes. But you, you submitted your bid. Now, 
first of all, we may have given you the, the commitment to x. Your bid is going to be, uh, it's an x, and the bid value is b. We agreed that you, you are going to bid uh, $550 million uh, of the reserves, uh, $120 million. Now, you are, we can give you the commitment and tell you, you hand in to the auctioneer this commitment, this pair of uh, commitments to you and to V. A, this is how we control you. Now let us suppose that no, that somehow you have a way of handing in the envelope without being forced. You are like, you know, the guy who is going into the voting booth, yes, and you can put whatever you want in there. But when the commitment is being posted, you made the commitment, so you know the decryption keys for the coordinates. We are all in collusion. If you don't keep to the collusion, you are not only, if you keep to the collusion, you get side payments. If you don't, these are illegal agreements, but they do happen. They are being done uh, in Bermuda, you know, like uh, we, from the last elections, we heard about Bermuda and things uh, there. So we, uh, we can compel you to reveal the keys, and therefore this is being posted, and uh, we, the, the cartel can see that you did not bid what you promised so to bid. Yes, I didn't you are right. Protecting the colludo, we have already protecting the secrecy, if, but uh, that was the work ended in 2009. But that's protecting the colluder if he wants to, uh, to, um, uh, to divert from the agreement. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yes, you have a criminal mind. No, there is an incentive, because I'll describe later on. The auctioneer, the auctioneer is, and that is legal, he is announcing uh, at the uh, announcement of the auction. When the auction is being announced, he is going to announce a kickback payment. He is going, ooh! He is going to announce a kickback payment, uh, so kickback payment to second price bidder, B second price bidder, which is going to be a BS minus R, uh, say one tenth. So Everybody who participates can say, I'm, I'm simplifying the argument, it's more complicated, says to himself, I cannot be forced to bid, even if I promise to bid the reserve value, say. I cannot be forced to bid the reserve value. If I bid differently, I cannot be compelled. This is deniable. I can truly claim that I cannot prove what I bid. And if I happen to be, and he, he has an idea that he may well be the second price bidder, I'm not going to win, but I'm going to get this kickback payment. And therefore, it is in his positive interest. First of all, he is safe, but secondly, it's in his positive interest to bid his true value. Matt? It's almost victory. Yes, okay. Okay, maybe, but, okay, maybe, but you, you have to prove that you have an incentive to give your true value. Yeah, and the incentive is exactly. First of all, it's victory auction. It's victory auction with a promise of a kickback. 
and the auctioneer is going to realize not the whole, the auctioneer is not going to realize the whole BS minus R, but he's going to realize nine-tenths of it. The question, one over 10 is, this requires analysis, you know, by these people who do. Uh, notice, by the way, that this is without, uh, as uh, they say in these studies, without priors. There are no assumptions about the distribution. Uh, these assumptions are very often very shaky and nobody has really uh, proved their correctness about the distribution of bid values and so on. But the auctioneer, because every bidder can, di can uh, 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 not uh, can uh, divert from the car cartel agreement, and because he knows that if he is going to be a se the second price, he is going to get. So you have the BF, the high BH, the highest bidder, and he is going to pay. BS to auctioneer, and the auctioneer is going to pay the kickback to the second highest bidder. This means sometimes it may be more, more for, it's maybe when you have this, such options like this, it may be more profitable for me to be a second one, not the third one, because in this case, maybe this one tends to well, le let's, let's leave the analysis. So, so we talk about the pe uh, no matter what, it increases bid values. In fact, possibly even below, you know, your true value. Because, uh, okay, uh, let, let's leave that because I want to, uh, we, we are here in the computer science. Uh, I, I want to show you how you do this deniability, how you get around this, how do you reconcile? So now, and I'm very close to the end, now we are going to do a deniable revelation of value. So AU has posted a secret value X by commitments, and he posts, let's say, 200 commitments to this. And this secret value is going later on to be used by one of the bidders. The bidder B privately meets the AU. So we make an assumption here, and we did not yet find a cryptographic way around it. So we talk about a real private meeting. But that's possible. And the AU reveals the value to, uh, to the bidder as follows. First of all, he reveals all the pairs of coordinates u1, v1, up to um, vm. This is, of course, not done in a conversation. This is done between the bidder's computer and the AU's computer. So these are being revealed, but not by decommitting. He tells him. X1 is 17,250, X uh, and so on. And now he claims, of course, that all of them represent the same value. So first of all, B, ch B checks that UI plus VI, mod P comma 1, is XI, not comma 1, of course. Uh, UI plus VI is, is X for I between 1 and M. But now, maybe he was cheated. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, uh, B randomly chooses, uh, so he chooses K, let's say a third of these. And not to avoid double indices, it's a random choice, but let's say it was X1 up to XK. For each of these, he randomly asks opening either the first or the second coordinate. Now, if uh, AU cheated him about X1, then the probability of being caught is one half, uh, of getting away with a lie is one half. 
And therefore, the probability of getting away you know, with lies is one half to the k. And then also, this actually shows that the overwhelming, so by the way, all of these are posted. And the coordinates which are being opened are also posted. Uh, you know, the, uh, the actual uh, decommitment is being posted, the health value and so on. It's all being posted. And those which were touched are not touched again. But you have m minus k, which are untouched completely and can be used later on. So now b can truly, so uh, b does something which I'll describe in a moment. And then he erases x from his computer. And now, even though one coordinate of each of these was opened, he truly can deny knowledge of the value x, because he cannot open the other coordinate. And he can claim that was told to him in private, you know, is any value for x. The second, for each of these, only one coordinate was open. The other coordinate remains information theoretically secret. So what is the x? Uh, I'll tell you. Years? I'll tell you. The x is now being used for doing this uncontrollable, deniable bidding. So we have that technology. We have that technology. Terrific. Now, let us say that bi is the b who had that meeting. He wants to bid bi. For example, he wants to bid his true value. He is hoping to be the second highest bidder. Anyway, he doesn't know what will happen. He is sure that nobody needs to stick to the cartel agreement. Nobody will be punished. Everything will be secret and so on. Now, bi had the value xi deniable revealed to him. So the AU has chosen and posted commitments, of course, to a random value xi. This value has been revealed to bi privately, privately. Now, bi, without telling the AU, in the same private meeting, he chooses a zi so that xi, the value revealed to him and proven to him to be the one hidden there, plus zi is bi. And of course, he doesn't tell. This is before closing of the auction. He doesn't tell the auctioneer what ZI is. And then he posts 3K commitments, Z1 up to uh, Z3K. This is two random vector representations of the value ZI. And the bid, now we have commitments posted to this and commitment po commitments posted to that. Until the closing of the auction, the auctioneer does not know. He knows what xi is, but he does not know what bi is, uh, what zi is. So it's really a sealed bid auction. On the other hand, when this is being uh, uh, at the close of the auction, the auctioneer is being told how to open these commitments. And the bids are, by definition, by the rules, are going to be the sum of the two. Now, the other members of the cartel, even if uh, BI is compelled to reveal ZI, he can claim anything about XI. And therefore, he can claim anything about the bid value BI. So he has complete deniability. And of course, they cannot put an envelope in his hand with these commitments beforehand, because o XI is being revealed only in the private meeting. So it's uncontrollable and deniable. Uh, then, and this I'm going to, uh, there are two things I'm going to say very quickly. So. It actually, the proofs of correctness are going to be done in this way. 
the AU will select for every bidder BI a secret identifier, which is not even known to, to BI. And then he is going to post things like this. He is posting the name a, a, a permutation of uh, quadruples like this. The name of the bidder, the name is, of course, just another number committed to, a commitment to the ran, uh, ve a random vector representation of the ID, a commitment to the X that he created, which was secretly revealed, and the commitment to the Z. All of these are being posted. Now, in the proofs, then he has to prove that all of these are, so to speak, value consistent. Some of these are being opened and arranged by the name and are being shown, you know, to really represent uh, the same values without opening the actual values except for the names of the people. And then in the proof of the ordering, he proves it in terms of the IDs. So the IDs are 215, 411, and so on. He proves that the bid, the bid is, of course, the sum of these two. The bid by, uh, uh, by ID uh, 2011 is the highest. The bid by uh, ID uh, 15,217 is second highest, and so on. So nothing is being known. And then he privately tells the winner, he gives him a private deniable proof that his ID was, what did I say, 2017 or whatever. And he privately, without telling him who the second highest bidder was, he privately reveals to him the second highest bid. And he privately shows the second highest bidder that he was the second highest bidder and gives him the ki kickback. And he privately proves to everybody else, also deniable, that they were neither winner nor second highest bidder. And therefore, they have no kickback coming to them. And I ran all of this stuff by very good people. I don't want to mention names, but absolute leaders in, in auction theory, economists. And uh, they really liked it. They really felt that for one time auctions, this really works. And that's all the poor man has to say. Thank you very much. Question. Ah, yeah, there is one more thing I want to do, sorry. One